this point, um, I would like to see if um, David Gross is in the room. Hi, David. Hi. Hi. Okay, so I would like to welcome David Gross to uh, share with us his vision of where string theory is uh, in 2020. Thank you, David. So let's see how to do this. Okay. Okay, is that set up? Yes. And you can hear me. Yes. Uh so Jeff asked me to give a vision talk, uh, but only gave me 15 minutes, which more or less uh, coincides with the amount of useful vision that I have to impart. Um, this has been an amazing conference. Uh, we're all astounded by how well it has gone, even though we're living in very difficult times, or separated across the world. And yet, uh, Jeff and his, his uh, collaborators have managed to bring us all together, not just the usual four to 500, but if I understand correctly, 2,304 participants. I find that amazing. sessions that I've attended, there have been no more than five to 600. But maybe people rotate a lot. But in any case, uh, no matter what the number is, it's an astounding achievement. And it has uh, been a great week. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. And that really is great because as we all know, the world is in a mess. I mean, we're faced with crises everywhere we turn every day, which never would seem to be getting worse from week to week. With uh... So this week, however, has reminded us all that we are a very lucky bunch. And of all theorists, theoretical physicists, and second of all, high energy theorists, and, but, and especially string theorists. We're lucky because as theorists, uh, even though many of us are locked up and have been now for months, we can still continue to work and produce all the wonderful physics that uh, we've heard about during this last week. Unlike our experimental friends who are really in a desperate situation, they can't get to their labs, they can't uh, explore nature you know, using experimental tools and observation, uh, but we can. Um, and we can go on. And in fact, if anything, uh, my impression is that productivity among this group increased. Actual evidence, you know, physical review has uh, worried that during the pandemic, sub you know, submissions would fall off and journals would suffer. But in fact, in theoretical physics, uh, submissions have gone up. So, uh, so we're really lucky. Not only uh, can we work, we also can do what we do, do calculations and explore on with paper and computers, um, the nature of reality. And 
that certainly is a great diversion from the mess that the world is in. This conference also reminds us what a great community we have. I mean, with the uh, 500 to 2300 participants, I look through the participant list. Well, uh, community uh, we consist of. Uh, and uh, the um, nature of the visual conference enables all of us to participate in ways that are, uh, you know, go, go somewhat beyond the usual conference in person, I think. And we, I think we're going to have to, in the future, adapt some of the tools that we're learning from the virtual world that we're forced into nowadays uh, into future conferences, which I hope will be physical. You know, we will be able to meet in person, but at the same time, we should use these tools to enable uh, more of our colleagues uh, around the world to participate fully in the conference as was the um, so let's go on to the physics uh, but we should uh, we should all remember that the world is in a mess and we're, we're all going to have to work hard in outside of physics to clean up the mess that uh, exists there are enormous threats to even our enterprise from increased nationalism and, uh, and they threaten the kind of mobility and collaboration across national borders that we take so for granted in our enterprise. So the conference has been amazing. Um, and just a brief survey of the various topics that we have learned. Um, of course, uh, the first talk I and, and it had to do, like so many of the talks in this conference, with the primary tool that is available in string theory and uh, related fields at the moment, which is the ADSC T correspondence. But here, uh, we really seem to be have for the first time a derivation or close to a derivation of a particularly simple case of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, ADS-3-CFT-2 uh, in a very special case which sort of corresponds to the tensionless string uh, which Rajesh and collaborators have are, are close to deriving in the sense that they can, they, they hope to be able to show that the observables in, in both sides of the correspondence obey the same equations that are therefore uh, This would be a major step forward and, and perhaps uh, lead to, uh, in many directions, to understanding better the correspondence and expanding it. Very exciting. Um, there are a lot of other works on, 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 uh, on more traditional aspects of ADS-CFT and new directions, uh, defect, CFTs with defects and their duals, melon space, technology, and much more. Um, some of these uh, advances are, are really amazing. Uh, and uh, I find them, you know, this happens every year. You uh, go back, as I did, thinking of this talk uh, yesterday, to conferences a year or two ago in uh, Okinawa and in Brussels. And it's amazing how much in this field we accomplish on uh, every year. There was also a talk on uh, celestial conformal field theory or flat space duality by Straminger and Poon, which I found fascinating, uh, also in its infancy, but uh, beginning to give some hope that one could really have a dual description of flat space. Um, 
uh, theories, in particular string theory, um, but it still seems to have a long way to go. Uh, then, of course, there were talks on quantum field theory, which Nadi likes to call the language of physics. Uh, it certainly includes more than traditional quantum theory, includes string theory, but uh, perhaps Nadi believes that string theory is just quantum field theory. In any case, uh, here we had some uh, impressive works on, on the general program, which includes the bootstrap, although there weren't many, or if any, uh, bootstrap talks in this conference at all, but rather general, the, the whole program of, of trying to derive constraints on, on the S matrix, on observables in a relativistic quantum, relativistic quantum um, mechanical theory, with or without gravity, from general principles. Um, and um, that is, um, you know, sort of in the old bootstrap. And uh, it seems to me always, um, well, absolutely fascinating and, uh, and in some cases very powerful constraints and some rules, but uh, the goal appeared to be originally, are there other theories that are, include quantum gravity or, or uh, are UV completions of theories we know about, which are not string theory? Uh, as far as I can see, uh, the general conclusion tends to be that uh, the constraints that one explores are realized um, in string theory and so far in nothing else. Uh, <clears throat> there were some very new ideas about uh, symmetries. Uh, dynamics in quantum field theory, fractons, um, and higher group symmetries, uh, which seems somewhat disconnected from what we're discussing now, but not completely. And as usual, uh, Nadi is certainly right that any advance in our understanding of quantum field theory will, will have implications for, for everything else we uh, work on. And then uh, there's what might be called uh, traditional, more traditional string theory um, studies, uh, including actual use of um, non-perturbative effects, uh, exploration of non-perturbative effects, instantons uh, in uh, string theory. Um, matrix models, uh, descriptions of string theory or uh, string field theory by Sen and Yin. These are very impressive calculations and certainly motivate, should motivate the community not to be afraid of doing uh, non-perturbative string theory. Uh, and, and then of course the, the study of uh, the space of of allowed, you know, of compactifications and um, of string theory and the exploration of other effective field theories that don't, do not come from string theory, the so-called swampland of, of uh, theories that, effective field theories that don't have a string and then presumably You'll be completion. <laughs> but of course, most of the excitement in this conference uh, occurred in discussing once again, but in a very exciting way, the black hole information paradox. Uh, there have been amazing developments in, in the last um, year in this direction. Uh, and we just heard a today was almost completely, uh, was completely devoted to, to, to this problem. 
Uh, I must say at the end of, you know, a day which began for me at 5 a.m. in the morning, you know, it turns out you can actually watch the conference and I, I really commend uh, the crew in Cape Town for doing this. I was able to talk from my bed over YouTube. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and it, it was such a great talk that I didn't fall asleep. So, uh, but after all of these talks and, and the panel discussion, um, although many beautiful results, it's not clear to me, and I have a feeling to the whole audience of whether we have solved or even what it would mean to solve uh, the black hole information paradox. Um, although I'm, the progress that has been made suggests that uh, we're getting cl very close to feeling assured that it has been solved to the extent that, of course, information is not lost. But as usual, uh, uh, raises more and more questions. And uh, at the end, which we just saw, so you know, th this uh, slide uh, was ma made before the today's talks, which is good because now I'm I know a little bit more, and I'm a lot more confused. <laughs> to a sort of a, a choice or a conflict between fuzzballs and um, a more traditional gravitational path integral approach to the problem, uh, the new element being wormholes, uh, wormholes that um, can occur in a uh, treatment of uh, calculation of entropies using replica tricks. So. It's not me whether there's a, these two ways of looking at black holes and at the information paradox problem are truly different or incompatible. At times I felt that they're compatible. They're just different ways of describing the same situation with, um, but, um, but that's not at all clear. And clearly the debate that we just went through illustrates that many of the pioneers in this field uh, disagree. Uh, rep wormholes, of course, um, raise the issue of baby universes and ensemble averages, which I must say, um, when Coleman uh, put forward this idea and explained how baby universe necessarily violate, sorry, the wormholes and baby universes do not necessarily violate any sacred principles. It, they, it just means that uh, one lives, um, in a super selection sector where the couplings of the theory are, are, are uh, couplings of the theory which one is sort of averaging over in the gravitational path integral are fixed by measurement. Uh, it always bothered me because it sort of seemed to indicate that um, many of the parameters that we need to calculate observables and uh, are, are not going to be calculable. They're, they're determined by uh, measurements, you know, by the brand, by the, it's sort of like the um, many universe uh, uh, and it's almost as bad, well, as internal inflation. And it just means that uh, one's hope that all the parameters, say, of the standard model and of everything else, and in string theory of the nature of the compactified uh, background is, uh, the, is not something you can calculate, but rather is determined by the measurements that somebody carried out in the evolution of, of the universe. So that might be true. Uh, 
uh, and presumably in that case, the only recourse to calculation of many things we would hope to be able to calculate would be entropic, but um, I always hated that. And is that really being implied by uh, understand uh, how the information gets out of black holes and so on? I, I um, am very reluctant to, to believe that, but um, it's certainly up for discussion and it will be probably for many years. Um, is there a way to distinguish experimentally between these two possibilities? Um, after all, there, it would be nice, as Andy said, to have an answer for the information paradox that depended on, you know, it was independent of the theory, or, but there's, in the, in the end, there's only one nature and one theory, which we're looking for. And uh, it would, unfortunately, experiments um, are difficult. Particularly difficult. Uh, and uh, so this is more of a question to the panel, which I didn't get to ask, but how would you actually distinguish by carrying out experiments, say asymptotically away from real black holes in the universe without either falling in, whatever that means, or preparing a pure state black hole? It would seem to me that that's kind of hopeless uh, for a real experiment, right? Because uh, black holes are always going to be in some kind of mixed state. And uh, a mixed state that decoheres with its in environment uh, is unlikely uh, to distinguish between fuzzballs and, and some kind of coarse grained average, which might very well be described by replica wormholes. So, um, I'm not sure there's an I can't imagine there being an experimental in the real world a distinction between these two possibilities. Uh, but obviously, exploration of this this question will, um, I'm sure, push us in directions where perhaps the um, incompatibility of these two ways of looking at it becomes more extreme. In particular, as uh, many people remark trying to push these ideas um, to uh, cosmological theories, cosmological situations uh, might be more, might challenge us in ways that'll teach us a lot. So I'm sure you can see that I am as confused as, as uh, I think is that many of our developments, but they're extraordinary and uh, and uh, we can come back, we will come back next year, I'm sure, in the following years to uh, discuss black holes as well as cosmology. And uh, I'm going to, so the real reason Jeff asked me to, uh, to end this conference was to provide an end, you always need an end, and to thank everyone uh, who was involved in putting this conference together. So let me take a few minutes uh, to thank people. And I am following largely uh, Jeff's um, reminder of who it is that's responsible for this extraordinary meeting. So the, the talk was great. It was a great choice of talks. and. Uh, the people who deserve credit for that are the Scientific Program Committee, chaired by Malcolm Perry, uh, Fernando Alde, uh, Agnes Bisi, Alejandra Castro, Robert DeMello Cock, Shira Minwala, Kyrgyakos Papadimas. And then, of course, the local organizing committee, which probably worked very, very hard to put on this conference and support string theory in South Africa. 
and I'm not going to read all their names. Uh, but Jeff wanted to single out Nathan Moynihan, who worked behind the scenes to make the web page up to date. The videos were edited and uploaded very fast. I can attest to that because I looked at them. <laughs> they are, uh, this was an amazing production. And then, of course, all of us, the speakers, uh, the panelists, the session chairs, and the every one of the 2,304 by now participants that made this the biggest string theory meeting in history. Quite amazing. Uh, but Jeff also wanted to thank all the people who helped support this conference financially. Okay. Um, Amanda Weltman and Robert DeMello Koch through the South America African Research Chairs Program, Frederick Schultz in the National Institute for Theoretical Physics, Robert Digraff at the Institute, Fernando Covedo and Atish Dabla, Martin Britson in the Clay Mathematics Institute, and Michael Douglas, Peter Svercek, Josh Lepin, and Vladimir Sadov, all of who gave personal contributions to support young people. Uh, and um, Mamogeti Fagkeng, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, who opened the conference with a beautiful speech, the Vice Chancellor of UCT, who was very supportive for hosting the conference in Cape Town. And Kiara and Edward Witten um, for coming up with the idea and driving it of doing strings in Cape Town. Uh, obviously, they've been pushing this idea for some time and made a big effort to help raise money for young people. Now, since nobody attended in person, I hope that this, whatever is left over <laughs> this money <laughs> will be used to help young people attend the in-person conference in Sao Paulo. Eric Nathan for his very generous use of the photography of, of Cape Town and Yvonne Brown and Melissa Largier for finding the best venues for dinners that we never got to use and the best merchandise that we've never seen. <laughs> but they did a lot of work. Um, maybe it too could be brought to Cape Town and distributed there. And uh, finally, Thanks to Jeff. I mean, we all should applaud Jeff for all the work that he's done and the leadership and carrying off. At some point, there's eight major classes. Carrying off uh, a, a, a seemingly impossible job very difficult times and making this a truly memorable, memorable conference. Thank you, Jeff. And next year in Sao Paulo, in person, we hope. Thank you. Thank you, David.